And so this morning, I, I kind of switched some stuff up. I had a sermon series prepared that I just felt like I was going to step away from for a moment because I felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to me on this topic for the next couple of weeks. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to look about we're going to look at slaying giants. I think there's some I think there's something we need to understand this morning is that there there are giants in our life. And, and, and we all have those giants that we face. Some of us, those giants may be unemployment, they may be anger. It could be abandonment issues, it could be sexual abuse. It could be materialism that we struggle with. Sometimes I think it's bills can be an issue. Grades, whiskey, unforgiveness, bitterness, depression. Fear, pornography, a career mistake. Maybe it's your future that you're, that's a giant that's fearful. And today I just believe that this message series that we're going to look at the next couple of weeks really just spans the gap of our church from young to old. Because I believe that, that we all have those giants in our life, if we're really honest. If you really search, you have those giants in your life. But today, that today, the reality is that we have to face those giants. If we don't face those giants, they're not going to go away. Never. And all they're going to do is continue to intimidate us for the rest of our life. To haunt us, that, that we look over our shoulder, or that, we, that we're looking, and in every choice we make, we make that decision based on the giant that we're fearful of. We make that decision based on what we're, where we're anticipating that action of that giant's going to be. And so today, I want to speak in, in this series, I want us to get to a place where we understand that we have giants that we have to face, but I want us not to have fear. The Bible says that we, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Amen. So no more hiding, no more running, no more uh, covering in fear, but today, to look at some some. some Characters of the scripture that can, that through their life, can give us some attributes, some things that we can walk away with so that we can be ready for the battle. That we can be ready to face our enemy. And I want to start this morning by talking about some years of intimidation. You know what that intimidation is in your life. You know what that giant is that often lurks in the Lord. But I want you to understand the children of Israel were no different. The Bible has done great miracles. God had done great miracles to bring them out of Egypt. You guys remember the story. God brings them through the Red Sea. He brings them through the wilderness. He feeds them with manna. He leads them by a pillar of fire by day and a column of cloud by, excuse me, by day and a column of smoke fire by night. I'll get it all together in a minute. And when I get it all in a pot and tie it together, you can say amen. But, um, but he, he would lead them. It was just glorious. God would go through, and at night there would be this column of fire that would illuminate everything. And, and, and they would follow that. Wherever the Lord went, they followed. In the daytime, there would be this, this cloud. And they would follow this cloud, almost like a, a, a column or a pillar, if you would. Like, a, like you, you can imagine, like a, almost like a giant tornado. And they would follow that. And they, and they went where the Lord, the Lord took them, and He would feed them. He would take care of their needs. And he finally brings them to the promised land. And he tells them, it's time to possess what I've given you. This is a promised land. Now, you've got to remember the story. You've got to remember and look back to the, God speaks to Abraham. And he, and, he, and he speaks to Abraham that he's given him a promised land. Abraham goes and he goes into this land. And God gives him favor there. And then over the seasons and over the lineages of the years, eventually... The Israelites, the Hebrews, wind up back in bondage in Egypt. And for 400 years, they're out of this promised land that God had given them. And finally, God sends Moses to take them back to this promised place. And so the land has already been promised to them for 400 years. 400 years, they've held on to this promise of this land. And they finally come to the edge of it. And now God says, listen, I want you to go into the land. I want you to possess it. I love this because God says, listen, now I brought you out of Egypt. You did none of that. I was the one who killed Pharaoh's army. I was the one who, 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 who delivered you and gloriously. I provided all this. But now I want you to go. And as you go, I'll go before you. As you step out in faith, I'll go before you. And so what happens in the story is that they say they're going to be smart. They send in, in numbers. They send in 
12 spies. To spy out the land. To see what it looks like. To see what they're up against as they get ready to plot and plan to take their battle strategy. And you remember the story in Numbers 13, the scriptures on the screen. The spies come back. And there's, out, of, out, of, out of 12 spies, only two of them said, hey, we can possess the land. That's Joshua and Caleb. They said, we can take this. It's our promise. It's what God said. God said he's going to go before us. Surely if God goes before us, he'll do it. And look at what the rest of the guys say. They look. And these are men of faith. Listen to their words of faith. They said, but the other men who had explored the land with them, they disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. And so they spread this bad report among all the children of Israel, among all the Israelites. And the land we traveled through and explored, it'll devour us. It'll devour anyone who goes into it. And all the people we saw there, they were huge. They were giants. Look at your neighbor and say giants. 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 They were giants. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that was how they thought of us, too. You see, we can't take that because there's giants in the land. And you know the story. What happens? Everybody begins to murmur. They begin to complain. Why did God bring us here? Why can we not do this? You know, oh, the, the enemy's too big. The, there's giants in the land. And what happens is their doubt angers God. And God says, you know what? You don't want to take the land? You can wander for 40 years in the wilderness. Amen. I'll just put you out there to all those who don't have any faith can die. off. That's what he did. And there'll be another generation who'll stand up and they'll believe and they'll believe God for something supernatural and they'll want something, they'll hunger for something and when they come and when they come to a, a, the right age, then I'll bring you back into the land. And if you know the story, for 40 years, Israel wanders in the wilderness. And to finally, the, they all die off except for two guys, two of this bunch that God allowed to be there. That was Joshua and Caleb, the two guys who said, hey, we can take this. But you've got to remember, they're up in years. They're, however they were old, they were here. Now they're 40 plus years old. Joshua and Caleb, they're probably in their 80s somewhere. And, 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 and now God speaks to them. He says, listen, I want you to take the promise. And I want to look at them because you see, there, there's some intimidations in our life today. There's some intimidations in our life. You see, for years, the Israelites now, they were spending 40 more years in the wilderness because they believed they were intimidated by these giants. And whatever, I want you to know that the intimidation runs deep. Whatever that thing is, it may, it, it may have hung on to your life for 40 plus years. It may have, you may have struggled with it as long as you can remember. But today, I want to give you some aspects. And I want to tell you, first of all, some reasons why fear grips us or why the, why the giants seem so big. And then I want to tell you how... We can have victory over them. You see, the first problem is that just like these people, we believe fleshly wisdom over God's Word. Mm. You see, they believe the report of the spies over the promise of God. See, some reasons your giant looks so big is because you believe what everybody says and you believe what you see with your own eyes and you, what you have, your own stats that you've ran, your own statistics, your own analyzing. And you believe what you have determined about the situation instead of what God has spoken about the situation. That's right. True. You see, you're more caught up in I think instead of God says. So many times it's easy for us to look at something, well, I think this and I think that. And it's not about what you and I think about that situation, but it's about what does God say about this situation? What is his promise that's attached to what I'm walking through right now? What does the word of God say? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you and I think, but it's about what God's word says, because God will honor this word above his own name. He loves his word, what he's spoken, and the promises that he made. And so many times we get caught up in analyzing it, what we see and what we think. It cost the whole nation 40 years of roaming in the wilderness because of what they thought. You see, we get a word from God sometimes 
And then we go ask somebody else what they think. Instead of listening to what God has spoken to our heart. You see, now I believe that we ought to take biblical counsel. When God gives us a word, it's going to line up with this. Yeah. But so many times we'll run to somebody else and, and they'll say, well, you know. And, and listen, you're going to always find somebody who says, man, you're believing it too hard and somebody, you're not believing it enough. You're going to find somebody to tell you something on both ends of this bed. Instead of just, sometimes you just got to take the word God gives you and you got to hide it in your heart and you just got to speak it to yourself and you just got to de declare it to God. God, this is what you've said. I remember, I remember about my dad's salvation. My, we, we prayed for years that my dad would be saved. And I remember just taking that word. God finally, as a, as a teenager, gave me a promise that, that he was going to save my dad. And I just hid that away in my heart. And I watched my dad run through a lot of bad places. But you know what I held on to? This was the promise. That God was going to do a work. It took many years. It took, it took an accident. But eventually... God got a hold of his heart. The promise was fulfilled. I'm just telling you today, you got a hold of mom, dad, and you got a kid that's out of the ark or something. You got a kid that's away from God. Hold on to the promise. Hold on to the promise today. I just, I just got to remind you that. And see, so many times, sometimes we hold on to our traditions. Rather than truth and, and, and living for what's right, we hold on to traditions. Sometimes we let our traditions. Determine how we see God. And if God doesn't just do it the way we think He ought to do it, if He, if he doesn't do it the way we think He ought to do it, then we just, that can't be God. He can't be moving in this. Sometimes we've got to step out of our tradition and say, God, I'm taking you out of the box. Whatever you want to do, you do it. God, you move. It's easy to, to try to place God in our boundaries. But can I just tell you, the infinite God who spans the universe is not going to be controlled by your box. He's not going to be controlled by what I say about him or what I think about him. He's going to live within the parameters of this word, and he's going to demonstrate his glory through this word. Yeah. Many times fear grips us at the moment of decisions. Many times when we stand there at that pinnacle point of stepping out and believing God, and all of a sudden fear grips our heart, and when fear grips our heart, we, don't, we, 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 we push back. There, there are many of us that God is trying to take us to new levels and new places in Him. But what we've done is, what will people think? What will they say? What will happen? Instead of stepping out in that place and not letting fear grip us, but trusting in God. I'd rather step out and believe God, what God told me to do. Even if I fell flat on my face, than never to step out at all. One scholar said it this way. Be afraid of your fears. Be afraid of your fears. They will pierce your heart. And they'll hinder your advancement. Fears will rob you. Matter of fact, can I tell you? That fear will always rob the work of God. Fear and faith can't coincide. Fear will, will rob your faith every time. That's why the enemy comes. He wants you to fear. He wants you to fear. If he can rob your faith. If he can nullify what God wants to do in your life. I think one of the other hinders we have is the focus is on ourselves. Well, you guys kick an AC unit on. I got 15 people fanning. There is what what do we do when we when we in this place of, of focusing sometimes on ourselves. Sometimes we're so caught up in what our past has been that we don't think God can do anything in us now. And we, that we don't think, we, we think because of what our past has happened, that God, that, that, that nullifies what God wants to do in our life now. And I just, I just believe that your past is not bigger than your God. Ooh, amen. I don't think your past is bigger than your God. I definitely know that my past wasn't bigger, that, that the cross couldn't take care of it. And listen, the cross will set you free. The cross is not there to remind you of what was behind you, but what you had to look forward to. And some of us, we need to take hold of the promise of God and take hold of, of, of what God has done in our life and then remind ourselves. Because can I tell you, the enemy will come with condemnation all the time to try to put you, to try to put you down. He'll try to tie you to what you used to be. Don't let your past 
And some of us, it's just a total life of faith. I just can't believe. I just can't step out. All those things will, will hint uh, or will leave you at the mercy of your giant. I want you to understand this morning that you know, the odds are definitely against you. The odds are against you. You're, you're, listen, they call them giants for a reason. They're big. The odds are against you in your own physical ability. But I want you to know today that you're in good company because the odds have always been against the children of God. You see, when you factor in the hidden element, when you factor in the God element, that's what makes all the difference. It made the difference for Joshua. It made the difference for, for David. And I, look at the life of Joshua. Joshua, some 40-something years later, he's brought in. God says, listen, now you're the leader of these people. I want you to go and possess the land. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, now God speaks to Joshua and he says, I want you to go and I want you to bring that people who wouldn't believe the promise 40 years ago, but I want you to bring them into the promised land now. And God speaks something into Joshua's life. He speaks to him about doing something that's impossible. Now, I like that. As a matter of fact, anybody ever anybody know what the CBs are? CBs? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. They're like the naval construction group. I mean, they're like engineering. And, and they have a motto. And their motto is this. The difficult we will do immediately. The impossible might take a little bit longer. How do you like this, though? You see, we serve a God that makes no difference between the difficult and the impossible. It takes in the same amount of time. It takes in the same amount of time. God isn't intimidated by difficult or impossible. And today, David and Joshua, they believed that about the God they, they served. That's why Joshua believed they could possess the land when he was young, and he believed they could still possess the land when he was old. That's why David would go out and stand in a battlefield with his enemy, Goliath. And today, I want us to look at Joshua's life. I want us to look at David's life. And I want us to glean something from there. The Bible tells us that the Lord spoke to Joshua very early in the morning, Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua, as he rose up, God gave him very specific instructions to go and tell the children of Israel that the that they were going to move the Ark of the Covenant. As the Ark of the Covenant was moving, they needed to follow it. But they needed to stand off a certain amount of feet from it. And he said, but wherever the Ark goes, it's where you guys go. And then he says these words. He says, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Concentrate yourself. Concentrate yourself for tomorrow. The Lord's going to do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priest saying, now take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they, will, they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. Here's what I love. Now, God was bringing them into the promised land. I love the way that God brings them into the promise the same way they left the old. Remember they crossed through the Red Sea? Now God brings them. Now they're going to cross through the River Jordan the same way. They're going to walk through. Now they didn't know this. All, all the Lord had told them was to keep walking. Now remember with Moses, God said, I want you, Moses, I want you to go. I want you to touch the water with your staff. But that's not what happened. These guys, it happened totally different. They, all they know to do is to take the Ark of the Covenant and march. And then God, God and Joshua tell all the people, to now listen, you follow the Ark of the Covenant. Wherever it goes, you go. But notice what they did. They, to, to grow their faith, to appropriate their faith, they did three things. First of all, there was, they prepared. They prepared. Moses, or excuse me, Joshua here gave them specific instructions. He said, tomorrow I want you to keep your eyes on the ark. Tomorrow I want you to follow from a certain distance. I just believe that sometimes we, we want to step back and believe God's promise, and we want God's promise to come to fruition without us having any hand on that promise. You have to understand, for God to do what he said he'll do, we have to do what he's asked us to do. You see, there, there's an expectation that God has laid out for us. There's something that God desires for you and I to be a part of, for you and I. That, if we're, that as He moves, we're to draw closer to Him. As, he's, as He leads, we're to follow. We have to put our hand on what God is doing at the moment. 
And so they had to prepare to be attentive to what God was really doing. Then he tells them to consecrate themselves. In other words, make yourself ready for the work of the Lord. I mean, of us, we pray for a spiritual breakthrough and we pray for God to do something in our life, but we're doing nothing to prepare ourselves and to consecrate ourselves to what God wants to do in our life. That's what church is about. That's what having a small room is about. That's what reading the Bible is about. That's what's praying because we're consecrating. We're preparing ourselves to receive what God wants. You need a miracle in your life? You've got to consecrate yourself to the Lord and say, God, I am ready to receive the work that you're ready to do. God, I am faith. I'm preparing myself for what you want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm hiding myself in the Word. I'm putting the Word of God in me. I'm praying. I'm spending time seeking your faith. I'm in the house of your believers. And I'm, I'm fellowshipping with other believers. I'm building relationships. I'm investing my life in ministry. I'm doing and serving. Not for the sake of doing and serving, but because I am consecrating myself for what you want to do. Because if you're going to do something in me, and that's exactly what Joshua did. And the Bible says that they come to the river Jordan. Matter of fact, it says that they, that they I'll read it for you. And it shall come to, about that when the soles of your feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, that the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. And the water of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. So it came about that when the people set out for their tents across the Jordan, and the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, and their feet of the priests carrying the Ark dipped the edge of the water, that the Jordan over, because the water of the Jordan overflowed its bank the banks of harvest, that the waters which were flowing down from above stood up and rose in one heap, and a great distance away at the Adam, the city that is in Seraphim, and those which were flowing down toward the sea, the rabbit, the salt sea, they were cut off. So that the people crossed opposite Jericho, and the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all of Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nations had finished crossing the Jordan. So here's what happened. That's a lot of words to say that the, the priest had the ark and as they stepped into the river, the river just stopped. On one side it began to just pile up and on the other side it ran away and immediately where they stepped was dry ground. And it stayed dry as long as the children of Israel kept going through now, I like that because it speaks to us of a couple of things. It is important that we understand that, that going through that river Jordan is a place. Think about this. When we, someone comes to the body of Christ, when they're saved, one of the things we ask them to do, we encourage them to do, that the Bible teaches us to do, is to be baptized. And baptism symbolizes our death and our resurrection of Jesus Christ. When they came through the river Jordan, that was a type of baptism. The reason we come through that is so we can enter into the promised land, right? We go through, I mean, that's what this Christian life is compared to in Scripture, the promised land. It's, it's, it's a blessed life. And so, listen, sometimes you've got to go through the Jordan. You've got to go through those places of faith before you can enter into the promise that God has for you. In other words, you've got to face some giants sometimes before you can enter into what God has. But it always has to be the first step, though. Somehow there's got to, how would you like to be those priests, the first priest, the priest on the first of that ark, who had to actually just put that foot out there and say, here we go, boys. I mean, come on, you talk about faith. That took a little bit of faith. I mean, all they knew, they were just doing what they, here we go. You, you kind of wondered, did he, what's he doing? That's not on this case. That wouldn't have been faith, would it? I don't know. But, but the fact that, and then God doesn't ask them to do it at easy time. No, no, no. The Bible tells us here that this was during flood season. So, so, so the Jordan is out of its banks. It means that, that it's not just the normal flow of the Jordan. No, 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 no. It's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. Can I tell you that God will always speak in faith for you to step into things that seem so much bigger than you want because, he's, because it wants the God component. He wants you to understand this is not going to be about 
You're just not going to get lucky here. It's not just going to be by your giftings. It's not going to be by your abilities. It's going to be strictly because you were obedient and God showed up. And that's what happens. And look, notice what they did. They crossed at the appointed time. This was exactly when and where God wanted them to cross. God knew it was in flood season. He knew it would seem impossible. They crossed at an impossible time. And then the water was held until everyone crossed. You know, it would be real easy for some of them on the back going, man, man, that, that's not going to hold. There's no way that's going to hold until we get there, man. There's mid I mean, you're talking about somewhere around 6 million, maybe 10 million Israelites. And they're like, man, there ain't no way that's holding until we get there. But it did. You see, we have to trust. And here's what the promise is this morning. This, look at, in Isaiah 43. It's on the screen. But now this is the Lord your Creator. And somebody needs to write this down because you just need to be a, a verse for me this week. O oh, Jacob, he who formed you, O oh, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Some of you are walking through some difficult places. I want to remind you. That you're not alone. That if you'll prepare yourself for what God's doing, if you'll consecrate yourself to God, and if you'll take the first step towards God, you'll watch your giants fall. You see, Joshua wasn't intimidated by what laid inside the land. He knew that they had 40 years of intimidation, but he didn't let that back him down. He was determined that he served a God of the impossible, and he was determined that he was willing to face. It. You get several hundred years later. They get into that promised land. Joshua, you read the story of Joshua, and then they drove out the sons of the giant. But eventually, because of Israel's backsliding, they, they are consistently plagued by the Philistines. And this is the, the same giants, the same problems. And we find ourselves years later, and now it's a little boy by the name of David. And you know this story too by heart. I'm not going to take time to read all the. I'm just going to give some verses. But David, just a simple 14, 15 year old boy, he gets asked one day by his dad to go to the battlefront and take his brother some meat and some cheese and, and, and some dairy products. He's doing a delivery service. And so he goes to the battlefront, and while he's there, he hears this giant, this giant by the name of Goliath, come out. And he makes a mockery of the children of God. And he just defies the name of God. And all of a sudden, it just crawls David. He's like, who does that guy think he is? But what probably bothers David even more is that none of these men of God stand up to do anything. None of these so-called warriors of God are doing anything. And so David finally says, listen, I will fight this guy. And everybody's looking at him. 14 years old. But see, David, David knew who he believed in. He knew that he trusted in a God of impossibilities. And David finds himself knee deep in a brook picking up stones. The Bible says he picks up five. He, you know, he just picks them up, see it out of the way. Anybody ever pick stones up out of a brook? I mean, you know, the ones that are like round. And so they're smooth, so they fly. You know, it's kind of like picking skipping stones. You know, you pick skipping stones, you pick those stones up so, listen, if they don't have edges, they'll glide across that water. And so David picks those up, knowing that, that trusting, he, he didn't ask for anything more. He didn't ask for a sword. He didn't ask for a shield. Matter of fact, the, the story tells us that Saul, King Saul, takes David and tries to arm him with all his weaponry. And David says, listen, I haven't proven these. In other words, I'm not good with these. What I'm good with is what God's put in my hand. So many times some of us are looking for some other supernatural or some other, some other miracle to take place, something else. We're trying to figure our situation out with this tool and that tool instead of trusting what God's already placed in our hand. And anyway, Goliath, some nine feet tall, 
wearing 125 pounds of armor, snarling like a World Wrestling Federation champion, size 20 collar, wearing a 110 size hat, 56 inch belt. I just see him. He's got, he's got one of those World Wrestling belts. You know, he's got, he's got the championship. He's holding it up for everybody to see. And he's like, come on, somebody, Imano, Imano. I don't watch a lot of wrestling, do you? <laughs> yeah, I just... Anyway, and, and, what is, and David, he, he said, he, uh, or, or 1 Samuel 17, 10 tells us that this day, he says, I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight with each other. Imano to Imano. Give me your best. <coughs> and can I just tell you, what were the odds uh, that David had against this giant? Listen, you had better odds, perhaps, maybe even with your giant. What were the odds? Your Goliath doesn't carry a sword. Your Goliath, your giant, doesn't carry a shield. But he carries the blades of unemployment. He carries the blades of abandonment, of sexual abuse, and depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the, the, the hills of Eli, but he prances through your office, through your bedroom, through your classroom. He brings bills you can't pay. He brings grades that don't make it. People who can't please. Whiskey you can't resist. Pornography you can't refuse. A career you can't get to go anywhere else. A past that can't be shaken. Maybe even a future that you can't face. What does your giant look like? He stalks you. You see, Goliath's family was an ancient foe. And just as he had pledged Joshua, now he pledged David. The words of your giant. Maybe words that you've heard for years in your life. Maybe your family went through a divorce. Your father was an alcoholic. Your father struggled with this. Your mother struggled with this. Maybe it's something that, that has been in your family for years. And just like an ancient foe, just like the giants that plagued Israel from generation to generation, maybe your giant has plagued you forever. But I want to tell you, with all giants we must face, there has to be a focus. You see, our focus has to be on God and not on the child. What do you see? When you, when, when you hear Goliath, when you hear your giant, do all you see is his Godzilla ability, his greatness, his how big he is? Is that all you see is him? Is he all that you hear him in your ear saying you'll never get through this, you'll never walk free from this, you'll never be victorious over this? David said this way, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine mm. that he defied the armies of the living God? Mm. And David shows up discussing God. Listen, David, the soldiers are discussing how big Goliath is and what can they do. David shows up saying, who does he think he is to date the name of God in such a way? Verse 37 says, the Lord David says that the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He said, listen, I'm trusting in God's ability. You see, it really wasn't a David versus Goliath. It was really a God versus Goliath. You see, you've got to understand, it's not you versus, versus that giant in your life. It's God versus. God wants to work through you. The Spirit of God wants to work through you. David majors in God. He's constantly thinking about the Lord. And he sets the giant. He sees the giant. But he sees God more. See, I'm not saying that your problem isn't real. I'm not saying your giant isn't real. But you've got to understand how big the God you serve is against that giant. That that giant isn't as big or as intimidating as he wants you to think that he is. You see, David sees the army of God. And because he does, 
He's not intimidated by the giant. David sees a much bigger army than the army sitting on the hill. Uh, David sees a heavenly army. Amen. David knows that the God of the universe has angels at charge over him. He knows that there's a bigger army. And David hurriedly, matter of fact, the Bible tells us in verse 48 that David hurries and runs towards the army to beat the Philistine. I like that. David doesn't wilt back. David actually runs. David says, listen, my God's big enough to handle this. I'm running to the battle. He's not tiptoeing. He's not crouching and going behind one rock and another rock. No, no, no. He's not trying to sneak up. No, no. He, David takes off running. He puts one hand in that bag. He pulls out one rock. He puts one rock in. And the whole time he's running, he's going whoosh, 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 whoosh. And everybody on the hill's leaning in. And Goliath is looking confused. Right to the point that he just pushes that helmet back just enough. And when God launches that missile, God steers it exactly where it needs to go. And all of a sudden the giant is stunned. And then he drops to his knees and then to his face. David don't even own a sword. He has to run up and take Goliath's sword out of his scabbard mm -hmm. and cuts his head off. When was the last time you ran towards your enemy? When was the last time that you believed that God in you was so big, so much bigger than your problem, so much bigger than your fear, that you took off and ran towards that which you've been running away from? You see, David knew who he believed in. I want to tell you that the God you serve is so much bigger than that thing that's intimidating you today. And by faith, you just need to take hold of God's promise and you need to begin to run. Quit running away and begin to run to it. Knowing that your confidence is in God. Knowing that He's able to do above and beyond what you expect, hope, or imagine. And David runs head on Head on. You see, we tend to retreat, we duck behind a desk, we crawl into a computer. Some move. We hide ourselves in this thing, in this element, in this recreation, this hobby, and we go from day to day, year to year, trying to insulate ourselves, trying to anesthetize ourselves from what's really going on in our life. Try a different tack. Try running towards. Refuse. And, you know, divorce, you're not going to have my marriage. You're not going to have my marriage. Divorce, you're not going to get it. I'm fighting. Depression, you're not going to own me. Addiction, you're not going to own me. And all of a sudden, instead of us running from those places, we begin to battle and we begin to run the battle and begin to fight. I want to tell you, greater is he within you than he that's in this world. The Bible has clearly said that you're more than a conqueror. David wasn't perfect. Let me understand, David was not a perfect guy. David had his own issues. But God used David because David had a heart that ran after God. Because David was willing to, 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 to love God. God and, and go after him. Matter of fact, Acts 13 tells us, uh, verse 22, it reminds us that David was a man after God's own heart. This was, David wasn't a straight A person. And you may not be making straight A's, but today you've got you to realize God's not looking for your perfection in your life. He's looking for someone who's sold out to him, who loves him in spite of their flaws and their, and, and, and their fallacies, who's willing to say, God, I want to be I want, I want to be what you've called me to be. And I know you can transform me. You see, focus first and most on God. And when David did, the giants fell. But the days David didn't focus on God, David fell. You see, if you'll focus on God, the giants will fall. But if you focus on you, you'll fall. You see, 
focus on God, not on those giants. You see, David, as well as Joshua, they were determined to please the Lord. David, matter of fact, if you look, you go back in this chapter and look, look, David didn't have a lot of conversation. David's main thing that he said, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That's what he said twice. And but over seven, excuse me, over nine times, David talks about God in this passage of scripture. That God's going to deliver me, God's going to do this, God's in this. And, and, and so that's a two to nine ratio. What's the ratio like in your life? Do you ponder God's grace four times as much as you ponder your guilt? Is your list of blessings four times longer than your list of complaints? Is your mental file for hope four times thicker than your mental file for dread? Are you four times as likely to describe the strengths of God as you are to demand your way? You see, we've got to focus in the right place. We've got to focus on God. God, you're going to bring me through this. You're going to bring that giant down. And, and in God, I'm going to stand victorious because I'm going to be the victor. Because greater is you within me that's in the world. Paul writes and says this way, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, no. As it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. I want to tell you, you're more than a conqueror this morning. And whatever that giant is in your life, it doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have, listen, it doesn't have to loom like a Godzilla over you. It doesn't have to walk through the cities of your life demolishing all everything in store. No, no. If you'll start running to it and say, listen, I, I'm tired of what's been in my family's past. I'm tired of what, maybe, maybe divorce, maybe, maybe there's nobody in our family that's ever made it. It stops here. Maybe, maybe there's no one in our family that's never struggled with this particular addiction. It stops here. And begin to claim that. Begin to speak that. If you've got a young family, begin to speak that over your children. That there's no more of that in, in my family. No more of that over my... The, the giant is coming down. But as long as we cower behind the rock, as long as we let him intimidate us, he'll do just that. I'm going to tell you that the God that you serve is bigger than your giant. You just have to believe that. And believe it to the point where you'll walk in that. Nick, if you're coming. Two things to remember this morning. If you focus on giants, you're going to stumble. If you focus on giants, you're going to stumble. But if you'll focus on God, giants will tumble. They'll come down. What is that giant? What is that giant that you're facing right now? It's a giant in your family, in your health, in your marriage, in your children. What's a giant on your child? What's your giant? I'm telling you today that whatever it is, your God is bigger. Bigger. And if you begin to prepare yourself for what God wants to do, just as Joshua did, you'll consecrate yourself to God and say, God, I, I'm, I'm so that I'm going to be. That's why David could run to the battle because David had spent time with God. He had spent time with God in, in, in the secret place, the Bible says, that he would, when he was out with the sheep, he would just talk to the Lord, he would sing to the Lord. And there was a relationship going on because there was a connection between him and the God of the universe. And so when he stepped on the scene, he said, how dare this guy? He's making a mockery, my friend. You see, God wants you to know him that way. As friend. Matter of fact, that's what the scripture says, that he's called us friends. I'm going to tell you, you need to lift your eyes to the giant slayer. Put your eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of faith. The 
watch what God will show up and do in your life. Watch what He'll show up and do in your marriage and in your family, with your kids, in your finances. Watch what He'll do. Why don't you just bow your heads and your heart? Maybe you're in this place today and you can be honest enough to say, Preacher, I don't have that friendship with God like that. I don't have that personal relationship with God, but I want it. If that's you this morning, would you say, use that today I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want, I want Him to be the Lord. Come on, if that's you, very quickly. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but you said, Preacher, that's me. Would you just raise your hand? I pray with you. Say that hand. Say that another hand. Can we just pray this prayer together as a church? And let's just pray it all together just to support those who, who, who have raised their hand this morning. If you raised your hand or maybe you didn't, but just pray this and pray it from the bottom of your heart. And just speak to the Lord and say, Jesus, today I give my life back to you. I ask you to make me new. Wash away my past. My failure and my shame. You make all things new. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you for my future. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's just give God praise. Come on. Praise. Pray God praise. I want to encourage you this morning. He makes all things new. I want to ask you, baby. Today, as a church, you're in this place, and you'd be honest and say, Pastor, we got some giants. We got some giants in our life. We got some giants that are trying to intimidate. We got some giants. They are, they are trying to stare us down in our family, in our marriage, on my job. If that's you this morning, I just want you to be very honest. Would you just stand to your feet? We're going to pray. I'm going to pray over you. That God just give you courage and give you direction. Because He's He's not giving you a spirit of fear and intimidation. No, no, no. He's giving you power, love, and a sound mind. I'm going to pray over you. And when I finish praying, they're going to come and they're going to lead us in a, in a little worship. Because I believe we ought to leave this house with a praise on our lips. Amen. Our prayer team is going to come forward. If you need prayer this morning for anything, they're going to be here to pray with you. And they're going to meet with you. Believe God with you that God can work in your situation. Even after we pray over this, if you want personal prayer, that's what that prayer team is here for. But we're going to pray and believe today. Why don't you just slip your hands towards heaven. Father, today I receive. Father, today I pray over strength. I pray mercy and grace and power in our life. And Father, they're walking through some difficult places, but God, you're bigger than the giant we face. And Father, today I speak hope. I speak life. And God, that the day that that enemy is going to fall. And Father, as we focus on you, we focus on our God. And the enemy cannot withstand. He is not bigger than you. And Father, today, remind us of the God we serve. Remind us of how big you are. And remind us of how much you love us. That what can separate us from the love of God. That we are more than conquerors today. And Father, we just receive the work that you're doing in our life. That those giants are coming down. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's just worship Him. Let's worship Him. Give Him some praise.